Um, yeah, well, this one. Yeah, I think elementary school. There's one or two years left. Um, Um, okay, my check. I'll focus on Um, I think we'll start now. Uh, so first of all, just to welcome you um, to this session. Uh, the session today is uh, towards COP27, um, the role of gas um, in Africa's energy future. Uh, for our online uh, participants, um, um, and 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 for in in person uh, uh, guests, yeah, welcome, welcome, welcome onto the session. I will start by giving a bit of a background uh, on ACF um, for those who don't know about the Africa Climate Foundation, and then I will introduce my colleague uh, who will also join in this presentation. And we are also joined by an esteemed panel. Um, we have Samba Fall from Senegal, Rachel Changoja from Tanzania, Richard Halsey from South Africa, who's with us here, and Salsa Monjane from Mozambique. Um, so to start off with, the Africa Climate Foundation, we're a very young and new foundation. I think we turned two in May. Um, and our focus is on climate change. And we, mo we mobilize resources to support climate change work um, across the continent um, of Africa. Um, and more importantly, we are the first and only African-led foundation based on the continent. Um, I think on that note, the people online, that's where you, you sort of give us some, uh, some kudos. Uh, but since you're not here, um, I'll continue. Um, and I think our key work focuses on the nexus between climate change and development, um, working on the premise that Africa's needs are different and 
we cannot afford to copy paste from the global north. Uh, but how do you unlock opportunities from the climate change interventions happening on the continent? Our work spans both uh, engagement with civil society organizations, but also with governments in, in terms of trying to achieve scale. Um, we have a high, high level panel, uh, Pan African Advisory Council, um, which includes uh, distinguished uh, scholars like Carlos Lopez, uh, previously of UNECA, Adnan Damin, who previously headed IRENA. Wanju Rutenberg, um, the executive director of RISE, and Clarice um, Irubagiza. Um, I hope I got that right. Um, in terms of programmatic interventions, our, our three main programs are energy access and transition, sustainable land use and agriculture, and urban landscapes. Um, we also have a think tank role, and at this meeting, we'll be sharing some of our high level insights on, on our gas work. Um, and so we like to think that we are both um, a foundation, but also a think tank in terms of informing evidence-based policy. Um, having said that, um, I'd like to invite my colleague, Helen, uh, to give you a bit of an oversight of our, of our gas report that we're hoping to launch soon. Let me try with this mic for now. So good evening, colleagues. Um, good evening, colleagues online. It's a great pleasure to have you here. This is a really important topic for the ACF, and this is really the first discussion in a number of discussions that we have planned around uh, the role of gas in, in Africa's energy future. What I'm going to do, do you mind putting up the slides? Great. What I'm planning to do is to kind of give you some insight into what informs our thinking in our energy access and transitions program, um, take you through some of the questions that we've been engaging on around gas in Africa, um, and then give you some high level kind of um, some of the high level findings that has come out of the research we've been doing. Next slide, please. So to begin with, um, what what is it that is informing our thinking at the ACF around energy access and transitions on the continent? I'm sorry, my slides are. <laughs> There's a lot of detail and I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but I think fundamentally what is informing our work is our needs on the continent. We need energy, we want energy, we need development and we want development. We have some of the worst access rates in the world and these are worsening. So 2020 was the first year that we saw um, access rates in Sub-Saharan Africa drop and we saw more people without access to clean cooking sources. Um, and as our population grows, our energy access needs are also going to grow. So we need to rapidly address our energy access constraints. We also need development. And to develop, we need to, draw, uh, to, to grow our industrial base, and that requires energy. Um, but we find ourselves in a position where we need to deliver our on our energy access needs, on our development needs, in an increasingly carbon-constrained world. So... While we have contributed the least to greenhouse gas emissions, it's very clear that we are particularly vulnerable as a continent to climate change impacts. And the IPCC's latest report um, shows just how vulnerable we are. So even though there's some important question, equity questions, the, the reality is that we don't have the luxury of investing in fossil fuels, which will contribute to more greenhouse gases, which will exacerbate climate change and will just impact us on the continent. Um, there are also some important implications for fossil fuel dependent countries, economic and trade implications. So we've seen that the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism will have serious trade implications for fossil fuel dependent countries. So this is the kind of context in which we as the ACF are thinking about the fundamental question, which is how can we rapidly achieve energy security at the lowest cost and leverage the greatest industrial uh, development benefits um, in a carbon constrained world on the continent. Next slide, please. So Effectively, we have kind of two options. Uh, yeah, two options. We know that uh, the moratorium on coal financing means coal is not no longer really an option. Um, 
we we well nuclear is back on the table and in, in some countries potentially the economics of nuclear have not been viable for a very long time so effectively the options we have given that we have these significant gas resources are gas and renewable energy but i think it's also important to mention that um, many countries don't have gas reserves. So, so the question for those countries is whether they develop gas infrastructure to import gas or whether they go with renewable energy. Um, and what we're seeing is that gas is being viewed as a preferable choice by many African countries. Um, it's, it's, being, it's being positioned as a bridging fuel, a flexible technology, base load power, et cetera. And on the flip side, renewable energy is still seen as high cost, intermittent and unreliable um, and adding to debt burdens. So from a research perspective at the ACF, we're very interested in understanding whether there was evidence to support the narratives that we're seeing around gas and renewable energy in Africa. And this has really informed the research that, that we've undertaken over the past year. Um, and I think, Fundamentally, our objectives, uh, as I mentioned, is the, the scaling of low cost, low carbon technologies that can meet our energy needs and development objectives, but also ensuring that we as a continent make our own decisions about our energy future and that those decisions are informed by the best evidence available and, and all stakeholders. Next slide, please. So this is a, a quick overview of our energy access and transitions program. We have portfolios of work on coal, oil and gas, renewable energy and green hydrogen. But I think importantly uh, are the lenses through which we are looking at these portfolios of work and that's just transitions, um, questions of industrialization and trade and also geopolitics. Because we know that especially with gas, much of the demand is being driven by the EU or China. And, and we really need to understand the global landscape when we're, when we're looking at what's taking place on the continent. Next slide, please. So I, I apologize, this is a very messy slide and this comes from the Global Energy Monitor and I would encourage everyone to, to look at their website because what they do is to track developments on coal and gas. And the purpose of, of this slide is really just to show the kind of extent of developments taking place on the continent. So if you look at the, the two last maps, gas pipelines and gas to power, the, the red is um, infrastructure currently under construction and the yellow is infrastructure that's being proposed. So there's a lot of activity currently underway across Africa to not only develop our gas resources, but also to use those for, for gas to power for export purposes. Next slide, please. Um, so with this kind of framing in mind, the ACF has gone, ha, has undertaken extensive research on, on what is the picture across the continent. And what we did was to set up a consortium of experts, multidisciplinary experts, uh, Salso, who's on the panel was one of them, to look at kind of three key themes. The first are the, the technical, the technical economic questions. So we looked at demand and supply, financing, risks um, in, in a number of countries. We also then looked at questions of demand and supply and risks under different climate scenarios. Um, and we to, to supplement this or to, to support this work, we also looked at political economy because ultimately, um, the, the, the decisions that are being made are influenced by the political economy in the, in the countries that are developing these resources. Um, so we were very interested in understanding the actors, the factors um, that are driving gas developments. And so we did some country deep dives. Um, and then finally is obviously the geopolitical lens. And again, um, looking, looking mainly at the EU and China for now. Um, and, and we've seen what the war in Ukraine has, ha, has meant for kind of the, the, the fast tracking of developments on, on the African continent to meet Europe's energy needs. Next slide, please. So what we did conceptually was to kind of categorize countries by their levels of development. And there are obviously differences uh, between within the countries in different categories, but there are, there are also important similarities. So we've looked at countries who are in an exploratory phase. So those, 
those that are looking to develop resources in, in, in the next decade um, and are currently exploring their reserves like South Africa, Namibia, Uganda, and Kenya. Um, emerging producers, those were the, the countries with major developments that are undergoing appraisal or financial close in the next coming years, Mauritania, Senegal, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Mozambique. Uh, the mature producers, these are the ones that gas is a very important part of their economy. Um, Nigeria, Egypt, Algeria, Angola, Equatorial Guinea, Libya, Ghana, and Tunisia. And then finally, those that are, uh, are driving demand, and that list is definitely not extensive. The countries in red are the ones that we actually deep, that we, we really explored in our research. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to end here with kind of the high level findings and also just just to say that in June we're planning on launching all of this, all of this research um, and also continuing to have these discussions evidence based discussions about about the role of gas in, in Africa's future so what we're finding, and I think it's important to note that there. The, this is a generalization of the countries that we explored, and there are obviously exceptions to this. But on the whole, what we are finding is that in many countries, gas is not a viable low-cost option to meet domestic demand. So for the large producers like Nigeria, Egypt, Algeria, who continue to depend on export revenues, um, they're, they're, they're needing to balance growing domestic demand and declining reserves. So the option that they have available is really to develop their marginal fields or to capture their flared gas, but this will have um, implications on price. So domestic prices will need to increase um, or there will be, there'll need to be government subsidies. The sub government subsidies will, also, will need to increase. Um, for new producers, it's quite clear that exports are, 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 are it's quite clear that, that, that developments are export driven and investments are export driven um, because these are, are more lucrative. So we're, we're not seeing significant investments in domestic infrastructure for, for gas absorption. So generally what, what we're finding is that this, kind of, this narrative about gas for domestic purposes is not borne out by the evidence. Um, we're also finding from, from the research that new gas investments are incredibly risky. So, so there's a big drive by investors to de-risk the projects. And this is often, this risk is often being pushed onto governments. And this is happening at a time when many of these governments have economic constraints coming out of COVID and have, have, have less negotiating power with the big IOMs. Um, and then finally, what, what we're finding is that the, the economics of gas as a bridging fuel are less and less compelling. So that uh, the falling costs of renewable energy, the rising costs of LNG um, is really undermining that argument for, for gas as a bridging fuel from coal. So that kind of in a nutshell is what the ACF, ACF is doing in the gas space. Um, and a, a bit of a teaser of what's to come in June um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And thank you. And thank you for being with us. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ellen, for that overview. Um, I think without much further ado, um, we want to take you on a journey from West to East and Southern Africa. Um, and I want to start with Tanzania. Um, Rachel, are you? Available? Yes, um, I'm available. Hi. Okay. Um, if you could turn, yeah, turn on your camera, please, and uh, start with an introduction of yourself and your organization. Um, and then if you could give us a country context and sort of a status of gas and development plans in Tanzania. Um, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Rachel Chagunja. I'm the executive director for Haki Raslimali, publisher to Pay Tanzania. That makes us an institution responsible for holding the government accountable in matters of uh, extractives. And we are looking at uh, mining oil and gas. I think with internet challenges, allow me to switch off my video so that I can proceed with uh, the discussion. First and foremost, uh, I want to comprehend the work done by the African Climate Change Foundation for the, uh, for the research to be good if you share it with us. But just giving a hint of what is happening in Tanzania is that 
with no com uh, confirmed oil, um, oil, oil uh, explorations uh, reserves in Tanzania, but we have discovered huge quantities of natural gas uh, amounting to 57 almost uh, um, uh, TCF and that of uh, helium gas along the Lift Valley and the southern part of Tanzania. Um, such a discovery has been uh, offers a huge opportunity for Tanzania with tremendous potential for diversification of its mineral, uh, mineral export portfolio. However, uh, with the current world supply running out, uh, helium discovery Tanzania uh, in the fields uh, makes it as a game changer in a sense that it is anticipated that it could potentially serve the entire global needs for the almost for the next 20 years. At the same time, the oil and gas sector in Tanzania remains as an integral part of the Tanzanian energy mix uh, and its major pillar in um, securing the possibilities to contribute to all the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Nonetheless, um, governance and management for the development purpose is torn among uh, the ambitious country industrialization agenda, uh, the global agenda to reduce emissions, but again, uh, the need uh, to supply cheap energy uh, at the domestic market and more. But also now we are looking at other factors as civil society, the menacing energy supply that is caused by the current uh, Russia and Ukraine war. Oh, this is something as civil society are taking keen interest on them. On the same. So looking at the ambitious industrialization agenda, is it a realistic or is it just a wishful thinking? Whether it is realistic or it's just a thinking, this is judged again in terms of the governance and the institution reforms undertaken from the past seven years. To date, despite having production started along the uh, southern part of Tanzania, still we are lacking uh, specific legislation to address natural gas developments. And this is treated, uh, the current production is treated as the wider uh, petroleum, uh, the petroleum sector. Natural gas developments have also remained uh, to be focused uh, in the need to facilitate toward domestic utilization. M more concentration is given on the domestic market to achieve a rapid socioeconomic transform uh, transformation, but also to look at internal industries, uh, the capacity for the gas to supply our local industries, issues of local content linkages, LNG transportation, institutional strengthening, electricity generation, among others. But as I've said, all these are just wishes. Nonetheless, the, real, the realization to the potential uh, gas production in Tanzania remains to be certain, less certain, because of the following factors. The prospects of the LNG project as a game changer remains uncertain, and it is an ambig ambiguous, uh, it is an ambiguous between politics, uh, government uncertainties, and unpredictability over priorities vis-a-vis -vis country development visions that now is causing more delays. As, you can, uh, as some of you have been following up, we started discussions around the development of the LNG project uh, uh, for the past uh, five years, but to date, we are still in the same notion to discuss. The, pros the, the future is uncertain. The other challenge is that uh, critical legal issues that seem to be burning, causing much delays, are those that are directly involved by the change of the laws in 2017. That among others, there's a big question around handling of any disputes in the courts of Tanzania and not uh, at the international arbitration centers, thus creating insecurities around investment environment. A concern to make use of domestic market, again, this is something with such a huge discovery and the capacity to supply the domestic uh, market, I think it is still very inadequate. We still do not have adequate industries that can tap from the gas produced now uh, as a country. What does this mean? We have remained with the shift of some of the industries now diverging away from the spirit of using gas, for instance, that I'm uh, cement, and now we are talking on discussion around uh, use of coal. The demand shifts towards other sources like coal, as I said, for the purpose of uh, supplying cheap energy. Again, it poses a risk to the current gas infrastructure that has already been in place. But again, it goes further beyond issues of climate change and environment and the level of preparedness to utilize coal as means of an alternative energy source. At the same time, um, 
you cannot talk about coal without talking about uranium. Tanzania is also uh, foreseeing extraction of uranium, a scenario again which poses environmental risks, but again, a, a global campaign uh, on going to totally no nukes. Where does this position uh, uh, we as, Haki, as Tanzania in that matter? In, uh, instabilities of public private sector relations causes a lot of mistrust among stakeholders, both for public and private, thus making uh, the agenda as an elusive agenda. Because again, we as civil society have our own concerns, the government have their concerns, but at the same time, the, the private sector also have their concerns. One of the major issues is part the citizen participation. The top, uh, the top down approach that has been designed in terms of the natural gas governance uh, and the agenda around resource-based industrialization is likely to leave a majority of Tanzania uh, 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 in, a, in a material uh, a poverty in a sense that there's a mismatch between economic development priorities as it is being said, but those that are really targeting local local communities. So here we talk about issues of CSR or corporate accountability or issues that are related to local content and the same. Now looking at the LNG export uh, as, an, uh, as LNG, uh, uh, discussion around the same over the years have been lagged behind and causing delays as I've said before. So this has denied Tanzania potential uh, windfalls that could have been used to, to power or to beef up a lot of development initiatives that are already happening right now in the country. So what does this mean? Politics have been uh, playing in between to ensure uh, uh, that have made it possible to complete discussions or negotiations around, around, uh, around the development of LNG. Confusion of what is needed uh, for resource-based localization agenda vis-a-vis -vis strategies that we have. Again, our Tanzanian vision uh, 2025 looks at tapping from extractive resources, but it does not provide a mechanism on how uh, for instance, oil and gas could be a potential factor to contribute to Vision 2025. Is it a direct contribution in terms of the sector itself, or are we looking at just at the windfall? So these are some of the discussions that we have. Again, uh, to, to sum up on some of these discussions, I want to tap on issues of climate change and energy transition. Currently, uh, we are civil society, climate change, I'm um, just two minutes, I'm finishing up. Okay. Now we'll come back to you on the energy transition one, because there's another question on that as well. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. So then I'll hold think... that for, for later. Yes, hold that thought for later. Okay. Thank you so um, much. Thank you. Thanks, All thanks, right. Rachel. Um, again, a, a very complex uh, picture in Tanzania around uncertainty um, and the politics of LNG. Um, I'd like to ask Samba Four from Senegal um, if you could please put on your camera, introduce yourself and your organization, and give us again an overview of your country context and the status of gas development and plans. So thank you again, Ashar. Thank you, um, uh, all of you. So I hope that you are hearing me very well. Um, as I have said, I am Samba Fal from Senegal, working at Enda Energy. Um, I'm also the climate and uh, systemic transition manager. So I'm very glad to, to share with you guys uh, some insight from uh, Senegalese perspective regarding this um, uh, very important important uh, matters. So just to set the scene, I think that um, uh, uh, at the moment, what we have seen is that uh, we are seeing an increasing needs of primary energy sources, mainly driven by fossil fuels in Senegal due to rapid urbanization trends, but also economic development needs and so forth. And to this regard, we, we, we see that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fuels are mainly the main sources in, when it comes to the, to, the, to the energy sources, but also uh, what in terms of cost perspective, the high coal uh, averaging more than 101 billion in 2019, uh, and averaging almost 2.5% uh, of the national budget, that which is very, 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 very expensive. But also um, the fossil fuels importation represent almost 30% uh, of the total electricity budget. Uh, so within the, having said uh, 
um, uh, uh, the, the, the increasing needs of primary energy is cost a lot for our economies. And to the other hand, to the, to the electric production, we see, we know that uh, in Senegal, in most of the Sahali, sub-Saharan uh, countries, is mainly driven from a heavily fuel oils and diesel. And in Senegal, 70% uh, of this uh, electric production electricity is coming from these uh, heavy fuel oils, and, uh, following by uh, hydro and solar power and, and cool, uh, cool energies. So uh, this uh, fact uh, uh, states clearly that we are still uh, uh, energy dependent on, on heavily fuel oil and diesel, which has more, uh, which are producing, emitting a lot of uh, GHG emission. And regarding uh, the climate perspective, um, Senegal have already uh, in its NDC uh, is targeting by 2030 uh, at, at most 20 in settings in terms of GHG reduction target, but we know that uh, to 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 reach reach this um, this this goal by 2030, we need to refigure out which option are more cleaner, and we know that from the recent um, publication of IIT, IIT, but also from some research publication, natural uh, uh, gas uh, is seen as greener option than most of 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 uh, the current um, uh, technology comes to the power production. So that's why in in Senegal we are and most of so of uh, policymakers are trying to do their best, are trying to elaborate strategies to, to, to have, to push forward this, uh, this energy sources in order to, to meet a climate change target, but also to provide short-term um, uh, short energy access, energy access of our local communities and, and, and the energy sectors and, and, and the, the economic sector in general. So this is, uh, when we are look at it deeply, we need to really consider these two facts, the, the short-term economic development needs, but also uh, the climate ambition targets, which are really also uh, of concern now when it comes to the to the to the to the feasibility of uh, the the pathway that have been identified so far into the NDC uh, and, uh, that's why also um, in, as uh, we are working as a non-state actor we think first that there are a lot of initiative that is being and being uh, developed now. First, we can name very positively as the gas to power strategy that have been so far elaborated by uh, the national government, which are targeting more than six, uh, 600 megawatt, mega, 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 megawatt um, uh, uh, power generation expected, uh, expected, but also this gas to power because of the new um, uh, new um, uh, gas and oil uh, uh, sources that have already been discovered in the, these two or five years uh, five years uh, ago. Uh, this give a lot of um, expectation from the government perspective because uh, this strategy will look at into two main areas, the downstream aspect, which are covering uh, power generation from conversion of existing power plant, but also new power plant, which are uh, the, 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 the greater total field, which will uh, try to, which will be, which will, which will uh, produce more than 250 mega, 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 but also uh, the refuse of store and additional um, sources, three main sources which are, have been identified so far, which are promising in terms of 
uh, power generation from the from from the gas perspective. But also uh, after the downstream uh, perspective, uh, this gas to power also is trying to update the infrastructure for transport and distribution. So in a nutshell, uh, these two pillars to provide uh, a, a sum of 600 gigawatts by, by uh, in terms of power generation uh, before for, for sure but when uh, this um, um, gas to power a huge uh, investment need and we really need to to tap into or to 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 finalize the investment uh, mobilization strategy uh, in order to 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 in order to ensure that local community will have a great energy access services so this is from the down um, uh, level here uh, the second initiative which are really in line we discussing is about a new initiative that have been uh, developed by MDA Energy with uh, partners, uh, which we are trying to 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 uh, uh, to to help uh, 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 government and local communities with uh, a process, the process only to elaborate um, what we call a low emission and resilient development strategies. Uh, in a nutshell, this strategy will, will be based on key pillars, and the main pillar is the energy. And we know that because we have uh, uh, several um, new plants that will be developed and will be uh, implemented in terms of gas uh, uh, generation, uh, we think that in order to, to provide uh, evidence and, 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 and policy uh, guidance, we thought that first and foremost to really uh, uh, help uh, experts expert to really develop own modeling uh, pathway which are really not only top-down, uh, considering top-down approach, but also bottom-up approach, but also uh, these trajectories or pathways identified throughout this new initiative will aim also to explore all relevant trajectories which can help to provide information related to technology transfer, but also um, short-term economic goals. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, initiative which are named low emission and resilient development strategy aim to identify uh, appropriate scenarios and, and, and pathway uh, which will help makers and also sub to identify into the energy transition which are the main pathway relevant for for our economies and which are will be which will 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 ensure that energy access also short term economic development will be also achieved so um that's what i would like to share for now when it comes to 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 really uh the initiatives that are being done uh, from the senegalese perspective both at the national but also from the non-state actors thank you sean for 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 for, for giving me the floor to share my my insight thank you Sandra, um, um for that very uh, uh precise uh, presentation um without much further ado i want us to come down to a bit south salsa manjano from mozambique um if you could please put on your camera uh introduce yourself um and give us a context um the mozambican context thank you yes uh good evening everyone uh, thank you charles uh, thank you um acf team for this invitation uh, I'm Celso Munjan from Mozambique, and um, I'm just, uh, assistant professor at uh, Edward Lopes, sorry, uh, uh, Jokishisan University in the School of Governance. Yeah, and um, I'll share a little bit of um, the broader context of Mozambique. Maybe I won't be as extensive as my other two colleagues, 
I'll go for more general um, aspects and maybe we can discuss the details afterwards when the discussion comes. Um, uh, allow me to just, um, first of all, um, um, and there's one thing um, um, I think Ellen mentioned before, which is quite important, which is the fact that we all want development in Africa. Indeed, we do want that. But the question now is, uh, do natural resources lead to development? That's the big question in the literature, in the political economy of natural resources. But um, going to Mozambique, uh, Mozambique um, became independent in 1975. Um, but just after that, uh, a civil war plagued the country for about 16 years. Uh, but in 1992, uh, peace accords were signed and, and parties um, agreed to hold uh, regular multi party elections. And so far, Mozambique has held six national elections at regular intervals. The country has been led by Filimu Party since its independence in 1975, which is to say that Filimu is in power for about 40, 47 years, if I'm right, my calculation is correct. But after the peace agreement in 1992, uh, which was followed by the uh, multi-party elections in 1994, Mozambique began to register impressive levels of um, growth rates with a GDP growth around 7.1% a year which is something. Uh, um, this is to say that during that period, the country enjoyed a remarkable social and economic recovery and, and managed to keep uh, the average annual inflation rate below the double digit range for the last 10 years. Uh, back then, uh, at least until 2014, uh, Mozambique uh, used to be a donor darling. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and, and, and in the late, in the mid and late 90s, um, the country decided to tap into its natural resources wealth. And in doing so, uh, the government was quite optimistic that uh, foreign direct investment in natural resources could be uh, the engine of uh, the much needed growth that would um, sweep the country forward along the avenues of development and, and poverty alleviation. Talking about resources in Mozambique, the country, uh, Mozambique in this case, possesses huge reserves of minerals and hydrocarbons, but the most prominent natural resources or natural assets at the moment are the huge reserves of gas in Yuruvuma Basin, which is in the province of Cabo Delgado, uh, which is estimated at something close to uh, 200 trillion cubic feet. Uh, and if these figures are accurate, so this will probably make Mozambique the old of one of the largest gas reserves in Africa, and probably uh, um, uh, the country, or maybe the country is set to become the second major gas exporter in Africa, after Nigeria, I guess. Uh, gas resources in Mozambique have been attracting um, a number of multinational corporations, and we have already um, in, in Mozambique, um, big oil companies such as uh, the Italian um, Eni, um, we have um, the Automobile, which are, are exploring um, the Area One, um, and we have the French oil giant Total Energy, which also which is going to operate in the Area Four. Maybe not, I'm changing the subject. It's going to operate in the Area One in Cabo Delgado. But so far, these projects are in the exploration phase and not exploitation. But so far, things have stalled um, due to the violent conflicts in the gas-rich province of Cap Delgado. So these conflicts uh, have led multinationals to halt their uh, investments that worth billions of dollars due to uh, insecurity uh, in, in the area or in the province. Total is one of them. Um, there's some kind of coming back but a lot of insecurity in the region, so the projects have just stalled. Um, this is to say that um, when um, that gas, uh, um, um, it's not a new thing, gas exploration is not a new thing in Mozambique. We have uh, back then, uh, we, we, we started producing gas in, in, 200, um, in 2004. Uh, in Inyambani, just in the south of the country, in Inyambani, we have the Pan and Teman and Inyo soil fields, which have been explored by the South African company Sazal since 2004, as I mentioned. But something akin to that 
the question that always arises because there are a lot of expectation about um, the gas that has been uh, about to be explored in, in the north of the country because um, the government uh, speeches and the rhetoric has always been that you know, these resources will uh, develop the country, will benefit the local population, will um, the boost or will maybe, uh, um, let's say, um, to boost uh, the, the economic sector uh, through backward and forward and fiscal linkages. But so far, people are quite skeptical uh, of whether these resources will benefit the country. If you look into um, um, the Sazol case, which is exploring gas in Inyaman, in uh, initially, uh, 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 the, uh, the, same, the very same idea of generating uh, benefits to the local population, uh, to the economy as a well, whole, I would say it has maybe uh, has not been realized to date. Uh, because many critics are that uh, the contribution of um, Sazol to the country is it's quite low. And that the fact that there are many, let's say, politicians are pocketing from these gas resources without really, really uh, benefiting the country in a way that is visible to the wider population. So that is kind of raising a few doubts of whether the gas in Ruvuma Basin will really benefit the country if no serious uh, political and economic reforms are considered. That's it's quite uh, important. Uh, maybe before I move on, I would like to mention um, um, uh, um, some important notes, uh, which are part of the wider political economy uh, of, of the country. Because as I mentioned, when we talk about the gas in Mozambique, we should, I mean, uh, date it back to 2004, uh, when um, uh, the first production of gas started, uh, with the Sazol taking the leading role. But there are a lot of, let's say, uh, political um, and economic, um, let's say, undesirable political and economic events that have been taking place in Mozambique, which have the potential to erode uh, or, or, or to take the country a little back in terms of development. The first of all, we had the military attacks, which we are waged by Renam that broke out in 2013 in the center region, which reversed the 25 years of peace that Mozambique had achieved. Uh, in 2015 and 16, the country was hit by an economic crisis that was triggered by the secret loans or secret debts, which we have revealed, revealed in April uh, 2016. And recently, we have these uh, uh, terrorist attacks that broke out in the gas rich province of Cap Delgado in 2017. And combats are taking place elsewhere in Cap Delgado as we speak. And, 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 and there's a lot of uncertainties about the, um, the gas projects in the region when they will materialize because all the projections that we have made from the very beginning now are kind of changing a little bit. And, and, and it's not really, it's really uncertain whether uh, the government will stabilize the, the, the region so that the gas projects will, will be um, um, implemented more generally. So, um, I'm not sure if I should uh, go on and talk a little bit about the gas and energy security. I'll just wait a little bit more for later. I'm not sure. Yes, I sound so yeah. Uh, thanks. So I'll, I'll just stop you there and then we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, I think we'll have our last uh, presenter now, Richard Halsey from uh, South Africa, who will also give us a context of South Africa. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Halsey from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. I'm a policy advisor and I've been doing some work on gas in South Africa. So I'll uh, just give a little bit of context. Uh, on the one side, you've got the plans, you know, what plans do we have for gas? And on the other side, you've got the sort of status quo, like what gas reserves do you have and what is gas used for? Um, if we start on the planning side, uh, there's a bit of a void. So we, there's a gas master plan that has been in development for probably about 10 years, but it's still not finalized. Uh, there is a consultation document out, uh, but it's not a plan. It's just some background information. Um, then where else gas might fit in, uh, you would hope would be covered by something like an integrated energy plan but we also don't have one of those. So there is no overarching energy plan for the country 
that would cover various roles of gas. Uh, so those are two emissions. What we do have is an integrated resource plan which covers electricity infrastructure. Now, till the year 2030, that covers 3000 megawatts of gas. But um, in recent research we've done, we've looked at how many gas projects are actually sort of on the boil, so to speak. You know, ones that have either applied for environmental authorization or have been granted it. And you get a number of about 14,000 megawatts. So uh, this is a concern because in some areas you don't have plans. And then when you do have plans, there seems to be an appetite which far exceeds those plans. So that's part of the sort of the planning um, sort of situation we find ourselves in. And the other one is sort of, well, what is happening and where are things moving? And this idea has come up of using the power sector as an anchor tenant for gas demand. So let me explain what I mean by that. Part of the reason they've had a problem developing the gas master plan is it's a sort of a, a supply demand conundrum. You know, there, there hasn't been secured supply, so people haven't built facilities to use it. And if there aren't facilities to use the gas, people are less uh, inclined to go look for it. Uh, so, you know, the, the sort of what's come out of this is that one way of breaking this impasse is, well, if we get the power sector to be our, our entity that's going to buy all the gas, this will help the gas industry out. And the, the angle we come from is, well, you first need to decide whether the power sector needs gas, whether it's essential, whether it's beneficial, before you use it as a motivation uh, to solve the other gas industry problems. Uh, so that's our view on that. Um, and just quickly in terms of um, the status quo in South Africa, gas is mainly used for the production of synthetic fuels. Um, this happens down in Mossel Bay at Petro SA, and there's also a facility near Secunda. Um, gas is not used for power generation in South Africa yet. So the importance of this is that we are in different position to other countries. So what other countries are doing, what they have done, you can learn lessons from it, but you need to look at what's happening in South Africa. And are these decisions, given that we're in the year 2022 with climate change and all of this, do we want to start the process of introducing gas? Uh, just a point to make is that we do have what are called open cycle gas turbines, but it's very confusing because they run on diesel at the moment. So, you know, when we say gas is not in the power sector, it doesn't mean that we don't have turbines that could potentially be converted to use gas. We're just not using gas at the moment. And very quickly to move on to gas supply, the gas supply that has been used uh, by Moss Gas and Petro SA facility is essentially depleted. Um, most of the rest of our gas is piped from Mozambique, and we've already heard from a colleague from Mozambique that there are uh, potential problems there around insurgency and, uh, and security of supply. Um, and there have been a number of discoveries made around the South African coast, Will Putt is one of them, but the future of those is uncertain. Just because they're there doesn't mean they will be used or that they will be economic to use. So overall, that gives us a picture of uncertainty. Our, our imports are on the way out and they haven't, more haven't been secured. Um, our existing reserves are almost finished. And the third piece of the puzzle is, well, what if we import uh, LNG, uh, which is liquid natrified gas? we don't have large scale import facilities yet. So you'll have to build those and then that will take a few years. And then you're exposed to whatever the prices of gas are. And as we've seen with what's been happening in Russia and Ukraine, they might go up, they might go down, but they're unpredictable. It's, it's a risk because you don't know what they will be. Whereas other energy sources that you have more control over, you can have more control over price. Um, so I won't go on too much more, just to make one more point about the status quo of our power system, is the argument is often made that gas is needed to balance renewables. Now, when we look at the South African power system, only about 5% of our electricity comes from renewables. So yes, in the future, we need to consider how we balance renewables, but our immediate problem in South Africa is not how to balance our tiny 5% of renewables. It's actually moving our, our system to a point where we have enough renewables to worry about how we balance them. So I'll leave it there for now on the brief context. Um, yeah, thanks, Richard. Again, um, one key theme that you see across, I guess, the whole continent is this idea of uncertainty. Um, I think each and every speaker has sort of spoken of the uncertainty that's there. There's sort of all these big plans 
um, in some instances, there is the resources, uh, I guess, in some instances, still additional exploration that's needed. But again, it's just sort of the uncertainty. Um, and I think um, I want to go back to, uh, to some of the panelists to also bring in um, the issue of the energy transition, uh, which I guess is one of the causes of the uncertainty that exists. Um, so I don't know, I'll start again with Rachel. Um, I think you're about to finish your presentation of speaking to energy transition. So if you could start there as well um, and, and share your thoughts on, on the energy transition and the impact that it will have on the plans in Tanzania for gas. Thank you so much, Charles, for the second opportunity. I only have two, two pointers left. Uh, again, it's the issue of climate change and energy, energy transition. The discussions around climate change and energy transition is now moving faster than earlier predicted, uh, with the renewable energy expected to power the world by 2050. So what does that mean for Tanzania? Despite as, uh, Tanzania have, uh, having made commitments to support initiatives around emissions, Tanzania, among other Western Indian Ocean countries, have been exempted from reducing greenhouse gas emissions under the Kyoto Protocol. Consequently, there are no international obligations to reduce emissions from the burning of coal, oil, or gas. This is so because the need uh, for the country to develop its own resources and for the need to reduce poverty, and that their contribution to climate change are also integrated. How do these link? Technology shift uh, to accommodate uh, discussions around or issues around climate change and energy transition is likely to affect the Tanzanian disruptive sector badly. The move from fossil uh, fuel based technologies to clean energy technologies will trigger a new set of minerals to support the transition. So, in that discussion, our levels of preparedness in terms of policy structure, institutional structure, expertise, it is still very critical for uh, this time around discussion. Where does this um, agenda in terms of climate change, renewables and uh, transition energy, uh, trans energy transitions, where does it position Tanzania that is investing for the purpose of powering its own development initiative? This is a critical discussions around. But again, what is the impact of such development discourse in Tanzania over resource governance? Because at the end of the day, as I've given the preamble is that as a country, we are foreseeing extraction of oil and gas as a mean to power our industrialization agenda. At the same time, we have to move with the pace of the world or be part of the world because you cannot leave as, leave as an island to ensure that the global discussions around the new set of energy needed is also impacting the Tanzania development priorities. So lack of um, a nationalized extractive vision and how it takes us in the near future for the purpose of economic development, but also human development is still lacking. The other question that is of concern for civil society, again, I'll pose it for the audience and panelists, is that is climate change still a needed discussion in the era of shortage of energy supply? It's up for us to, to discuss maybe later. Um, again, food for thought on the geopolitics and the menacing energy supply caused by the Russian war. Again, these are the questions that I wouldn't want to comment, but I'll be happy to be part of the discussion. How are frontier countries like Tanzania, Mozambique prepared with the current need or current shortage? Where do we position the regional resources over the current demand and the need to fast track extractive projects in the discussions around climate change, energy transition and technological changes across the supply channels? In the case whereby Africa and maybe weaker countries decide to take a step back in this era. What, what is or what will be our position or also the power and the control of the giant states? Where do we learn or how do we learn from the Libya oil case, case study? So for me, at the end of the day, it's that Africa, Tanzania, including uh, Africa, particularly Tanzania, I think we need a clear policy direction 
um, to steer up the country and the regional towards a sustainable path in the current era, but vis-a-vis -vis also foreseeing the future. We need to undertake a cost-benefit analysis on what is needed in terms of development discourses ag against uh, the global the global agenda. Just to finish up, Charles, I'll not have any comments. I think as Tanzania, we are moving faster than the speed of red on gas. I think we need to take a step back and rethink extractive and development for Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time. Um, and since we want to open it up for discussion as well, um, I won't come back to the other panelists for now, but uh, I just want to open it up to questions. I don't know whether we have any questions uh, in the room um, or online. I'll start in the room. big extraction with this narrative that you need some sort of extractive driven industrialization means development and linked to GDP and a lot of very old style economic models. So if Africa wants to develop itself in a new way, should we not be looking at the economics um, system and then look at what energy system would match that economic system rather than we, we there was a statement about not wanting to copy the north but what we seem to be doing is copying the north um so i guess that's a, a, a question for the for every panelist and then i also wanted to ask why renewables are just treated as one word renewables can involve biomass biogas solar water heating, solar voltaics, wind, and wind is then offshore and onshore with different levels of re reliability. There are all sorts of industrial processes related to all of them. And then you've got this whole electric vehicles. You know, there, there are a whole range of different development paths. And, and we seem to have fallen into what is quite frankly a fossil fuel narrative that renewables are just one thing that you clump together and they're unreliable and intermittent and they don't work. So, um, yeah, I was expecting things to be a bit more innovative in this discussion. So it's a question of clarity. Thank you. So um, I'll just give a few thoughts and build up on what some of the things that she said. Um, so she commented in terms of uh, the conversation being about the big projects in gas um, development. And while I was listening, uh, what came out across is also just the role of Africa as a producer and potential distributor. But there was very little conversation about consumption. There was a bit of highlighting in terms of the low gas use um, in Africa, but there's very little conversation, especially on gas use in Africa which is very concerning because we're talking about gas as a transition fuel in light of energy transition. So what are we talking about in terms of our own local use of gas as a transition fuel? So one of the things uh, we've been doing in Kenya specifically, we've been going to communities and looking at the transition from dirty fuels to cleaner option or cleaner fuels. Some of the communities we engage in are very rural communities where you find for instance, um, a company came and they gave them this gas tank, um, LPG, um, what are they called? The containers, those LPG containers. And once that was depleted, they've left them. And now, you know, they're back to using their own fuels. So what's the sustainability of this for the community? So we need to look more into the pricing, accessibility, affordability, and how gas can be adapted to be used by the communities. Um, I'm very happy to hear about um, the, uh, what you talked about in terms of electricity production, because it's one of the things I was thinking about. If you're talking about a transition fuel, 
and right now gas is a bit cheaper than renewables. Uh, can we think about electricity production? I would love to hear more recommendations from you perhaps and from your organization, whether you can look into that and perhaps even recommend to African countries some of the pathways in terms of using gas um, for electricity production. Um, the other thing I think in relation to that was, let me see, let me see. Yeah, um, so as moving forward or looking long-term, uh, renewable energy is going to be cheaper than gas. And so how can we forecast how long gas is going to be an option for uh, in, this transition, um, in this transition discussion? And then, let me see, lastly, I think I'll stop it at that to give others an opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. No, but it, it, I mean, that's a really, really good question, right? Um, one is um, regarding the Congress from Mozambique, because one would have expected by now that there is an analysis of what really is happening on, you know, Cabo Delgado region, because people are hearing about this Islamic insurrection. It doesn't really make sense. I do think, for me, is a cover for the role, particularly, of South African imperialism and the investment in that region, and how the plundering is causing the struggle to resources and communities that are deprived in the land of people, as we see in many South African communities. And I do think that, um, you know, for many people who you know, think that South African army that is sent there, is sent there to suppress communities that are genuinely aggrieved about the injustice of extraction from their land, from which they are benefiting, that, uh, or rather the, 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 the imperialist agenda is sued by the narrative that um, there is some religiously motivated insurrection that has nothing to do with the struggle for, for the resources and is not part of the sequence. And I'm not saying that the political program of the insurrection is, is, is anything to support, but I'm just saying that there's a context and I think the, the movement in Mozambique can do all of the justice in terms of exposing all of that. The, the, the second thing I think is just really building on the question that the community has said, because I think for me, it's really about who should be at the center of this conversation about just transition. And I think as with my contribution, probably in other sessions, it's about the centrality of the working class. Because I think the idea that we are going to make just transition by talking sense, by appealing to the conscience, of the cooperate interest in the fossil fuel industry and other uh, economic sectors. It's not going to work, right? We need to build a movement. And I think that movement will be built on the basis that the, the program for climate justice, the program for just transition is about, in the final analysis, the struggle for jobs, the struggle for economy that can work for many, not for a few. And I think, you know, um, the company that I spoke about, you know, renewables, what do you really mean by that? But also, how do they solve and speak to the crisis of the deepening crisis of energy poverty? Um, because more and more people in this country are disconnected, right, uh, from the grid, simply because it's unaffordable. Since the beginning of the crisis in ESCOM, uh, the tariff has increased between 2007 to 2020 uh, by 512%. Last year, by 15% of that 512%. This year, by number six percent uh, and so on. You look at the, the fallback, you know, it's part of it. It is increased by 57 percent um, uh, in terms of price last year. Um, you know, the price of, of, of oil and I think others that people have spoken about in the context of the war in Ukraine. But the issue is if the working class is to mobilize, is to organize, and to fight for climate justice, for, for, for energy transition, for just transition, what program are we putting that says this is our alternative? An alternative to call where the community is employed, right? People want to eat, people want to work. What are we putting for? But what are we saying? And I thought this session would be about conversation on that. To say, no, last year, solar power and wind power produced 
at a tree that is 200% cheaper than what is coming out of Medubi and Kusi, right? So this says that, for instance, in an area like Shukune, where I come from, where there's an all year round sunshine, you can have people powered um, without all the worry about, you know, intermediate, but also in a much more affordable basis. I, I, don't, I don't hear those conversations coming out and that for me to do um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, the... Oh. Ryan? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Charles and panel. We have a question from our online attendee, from Rita Mayana. I would like to thank the panelists for the great presentations. My main question is whether Africa faces a risk of having standard gas assets as we transition renewable energy. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, thanks for that. So the good thing about moderating is that um, I don't have to answer the hard questions um, and I can, I can immediately pass that on to, to the panelists. I wanted to start with Celso. Um, I think Celso, there's a question around the old developmental model, and I'm sure you, you have some comments around the political economy that actually informs the idea of these big projects and not uh, as small projects. Um, so, Salsa, if we start with you, and if you also speak to uh, the comrades' interventions around uh, Cabo Delgado as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles. Um, Besides this question, there are more other questions, but before um, um, I answer those, just to mention a little bit that um, in my point of view, um, uh, gas uh, um, as a commodity offers a wide range of opportunities for countries to industrialize rapidly, as it was the case in the West with the coal uh, in the terms of industrial revolution. Uh, um, and, and, and now we see China and, and the India also kind of polluting the environment for their own development, which is bad, of course. But then, um, that, that it's been that there's something I remember. I think it was Patrick Bond who mentioned something quite important about the climate debt, in the sense that uh, well, most of the countries that um, um, we all support the movement. Uh, I mean, the climate change, of course. But most of the companies now, they're kind of suggesting that um, Africa should leave their resources on the ground in the name of I mean, I mean, in move to renewable energy. Uh, should probably play the debt to these African countries that um, um, are now suffering the effects of this climate change, but didn't pollute um, that much. Has been known that Africa, generally, if my, uh, if I'm correct, uh, pollutes uh, the pollution, um, the levels of pollution. If you look at the global the global scheme, it's below five percent, which is almost nothing comparing to many other countries. But be that as it may. Um, just uh, going straight to your question, you talk about developed models, which is <laughs> it's a, somewhat a quite complex um, um, a question, and um, it's a simple question, but the answer will be quite complex to, uh, to discuss a little bit about that, especially when you talk about natural resources, because as we know, natural resources and politics, they are somehow, they all go, go together. Uh, that technical stuff, but they're also um, um, what the elites, um, uh, what kind of, um, let's say um, the power relationship between not among elites, but also between the elites and these uh, big companies that um, um, are investing in Mozambique. But I mean, I think for Cap Delgado and the gas projects, I think the scenario is quite different. A lot of things we don't know uh, um, uh, about what's happening. Um, and one thing we saw in the very beginning when this company is starting um, to operating, uh, is the conflicts we could see during the resettlement process. And uh, the communities, we are not happy with the process. Um, there are uh, uh, some conflicts that took place between the government and, and the communities and the communities complaining that these companies, we are not honoring their promises. Uh, and, but also there's something very interesting happening in Cap Delgado. Cap Delgado is unique. Uh, because now Cap de Gaulle became some sort of uh, a camp of organized crime. I don't know if you're aware that most of the drug that is um, comes from Afghanistan is cheaper to Pakistan and enters in Mozambique through Cap de Gaulle. So uh, in the meantime, you have a lot of this, uh, illegal mining, rubies and, 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 and gemstones. And 
across uh, the provinces. So you have a lot of uh, <laughs> interests that conflict in, in the same space. And then now that you have the gas oil, um, I mean, the gas companies, they have to control certain region in order for them to operate. Some believe that that is creating a little bit of tension because if the oil companies have to control a certain area along the coast and the sea, and part of the area is where the drug has been shipped to Cabo Delgado, it is likely, I mean, there's no evidence, but people even think that maybe some groups are kind of contesting uh, 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 the presence of these multinationals. We don't know. That's a lot of speculation around that, so to say. Um, yeah, uh, thanks also. I'll, I'll just have to try to go to the other panelists as well. Um, Richard, if you want to respond to the question. Okay, well, there's a few that I could respond to. Maybe I'll um, start with, I think it was Teresa from Kenya, about um, gas in the power sector. So to come back to a point I made earlier is that every country needs to look at their circumstances. If you already have reliable gas supply, you already have the plants, what you're gonna do with those is different to countries that are on the cusp of investing in them. So what I can give is a brief example from South Africa and, and how you go about making the decisions. So in South Africa, it would be a case of investing in new gas-fired power stations and also developing the supply. So if you're comparing new options, you'd say, okay, do I build gas or do I build something else? And, and also what does gas do in the system? So if we talk about bulk supply, in other words, where should most of your electricity come from? The, the levelized cost of energy, which is when we assess a project and you say, look, this is how much the lifetime costs are and you divide by how much electricity you expect to get out of it, you get a, a cost per kilowatt hour. So for bulk supply, there is consensus that renewables, and to Liz's point that uh, in this country, it's uh, solar and onshore wind are already cheaper than gas. So there is not an economic case or an economic need to build gas to supply bulk supply. And there's reasonable consensus on that. Where there is more debate is, do you need gas for this peaking function? Now, when I say peaking, it is in the early morning or the late evening, everyone's turning on their appliances, your demand spikes, your other generators can't cover it all. So do you need gas to fill this gap? Um, now in the short sort of time frames of uh, less than say three to four hours, uh, battery storage and other types of storage are already now cost competitive with gas in South Africa. So economically, the argument echoes there for bulk supply is that it's actually cheaper to build new storage than new gas. Again, I'm belaboring the point that you can't compare apples and oranges when you say, well, we've got an old one that's cheap versus a new one. We're just talking about how do we move forward in the transition? The sticky point where there's debate in South Africa is this longer term balancing. Say you have a weather system that knocks out all your renewables for a week. What do you do then? And that's where a lot of the debate in South Africa is. Um, but again, to come back to my earlier point, we have so few renewables that in South Africa, this is not a big concern yet. But again, for other countries, you'll need to look at what your power sector has, what the options are, and also the price trends. So this will be my last point on this so we can move on, is that battery storage wasn't even on the radar five years ago. Now, since about 2019, costs halved. So if you think of the revolutions that happened in sort of the world of energy, renewables dropped dramatically, but battery storage, the prices are dropping even faster. Whether this will continue, what will happen with the war in Ukraine uh, on supply chains and all of that remains to be seen, but there's a trend of alternatives to gas decreasing rapidly in price. And also we've seen a trend with the risks of gas making them potentially more expensive, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, on the, there was a, an, an additional question around um, the stranded assets conversation, and I think um, Richard, you've sort of dealt with it a bit. Uh, Samba, I don't know whether you want to respond to that in terms of uh, the Senegalese assets and, and sort of this risk of uh, stranded assets. Um, yes, sir. So I want to to share to to share with on the particular aspect and just uh, for the overall question that have been raised so far is again to to state the, the approach they are trying to, to initiate in Senegal. Uh, 
because in Senegal, from a government perspective, we are a, a new oil producer. So we are just real initial uh, steps. And there are a strategy into new resources. So what we have uh, expressed in terms of approach for non-state actors, perspective, we, if we really take, take, take advantage of these new uh, energy sources and to, to don't lose ourselves uh, because we have a need in terms of economic development uh, because we are still uh, having a demand which is still there. So what we should do, um, we have to, 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 to not only try to, to, to see this process of that approach, but rather having a, a down, a bottom approach where we will try to explore with some common expertise. Because here what we are trying is to explore any, any option that can help to reach these two objectives. Economic short term energy access needs, but also try to, to, to identify green uh, pathway for the, 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 the economy wide, not only on the energy sector, because energy sector is a, a cross cutting uh, sectors, which is where the demand are coming from, because agriculture have and developing a vulnerable countries when it comes to the climate change. So definitely, if we need to improve our agricultural sector, we need to improve the energy access. The same also, the same applies for industry, but also the, the, the third and urbanization sector. For these pillars that we have identified, we will, that what we are trying to do with all communities and subnational and effort to come up with a process, a process to showcase the uh, added value of trying to explore any you know, option that have to be put in place. In general, uh, we are, as a non-state actors, trying to help the government key information on what should be done and how it is this our main uh, 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 approach and we will try to really to, to put forward this approach instead of just providing the, the, uh, uh, a solution that are still not yet uh, working uh, at all for most of Thank our you. oil producer companies, uh, countries in Africa. Thank you, Samba. Uh, Alan? Thanks, Charles. I just wanted to address Liz's point about the alternative economic models and, and looking at renewable energy and the renewable energy value chain. I think it's absolutely essential that we do that. Um, and I, I think that maybe kind of the, the downfall of discussions like this is that we focus on gas without looking at the kind of broader picture and the broader energy transitions picture. For the ACF, our starting point was really just on, on the gas work was really to look at what are the narratives around gas on the continent and are those borne out by evidence? Um, and similarly, well, on, on the renewable energy side is really asking some of the questions that, that you raised. How can we spur different economic models around our, our renewable energy resources? How can we support industrialization, et cetera? Um, I think the other point on the, on, on the stranded asset risk is that from, from our research that we are seeing that there's a, a massive stranded asset risk for new, new projects, um, that the, we're, we're sinking, we're potentially sinking a lot into projects that in 20 years might not have the global demand. Um, and that these are the really important questions that we should be grappling with as, as countries on the continent, um, especially kind of in the context, I mean, if we look at what's happening in Ukraine and, and Europe coming to Africa and saying, can you help us meet our immediate demand? What's gonna to happen to, to Europe demand, Europe's demand in the next 20 years? 
and, and what does that mean for, for countries who are currently investing heavily in export infrastructure? So I think that it's, it's quite clear that there is stranded asset risk. Um, I think my last point, and, and this is kind of back to, to the, the interest for us in, in interrogating the veracity of the narratives, is that I, I, I think it's, it's really fascinating that, that Celso, you described this picture where gas hasn't really yielded the economic benefits or, or, or the, um, the electrification benefits, but you still see potential of gas for industrialization. And, and for me, it's, we need to understand what it is about gas that is so appealing, despite the evidence to show that it isn't having the benefits that, that, that it says or, or that we expect it to have. Um, and maybe that goes back to, to Liz's point about it's really important that we, we then look at the kind of broader, we, we look at this in, in the context of renewable energy too, and the alternatives. And if we're saying no to gas, we need to have a picture of, of what, what, what we have available to us and what we can build on. Um, if um, uh, it could take forever to discuss this topic and it would take us a lot of time. Um, and so we would just about, uh, uh, time bound and so I just want to go back to our panelists to just give um, the quick closing remarks um, and just to note I mean this is one the beginning of, of of a couple of these dialogues that we will have and we'll keep trying to build um, on each and hopefully get enough time to interrogate the issues um, and so if I start um, if I start with Rachel again uh, to give sort of in, in 30 seconds just of your closing remarks please um, thank you so much, Charles. Again, uh, actually, I wanted to comment on the question around uh, consumption, but that will be for another discussion. My yes, takeaway yes. and my recommendation in this will be, I think we need to rethink, take a step back to rethink our decisions. Uh, we need to invest heavily on cost-benefit analysis. I think that's what we are talking about. How much does it benefit? African countries, the hard truth is that we make development initiatives or we plan for development based on the today's needs. So if a demand to increase employment, uh, medical, medical facilities, and there's a huge investment coming on board, we always run it towards that. But we fail to, do, uh, to undertake cost-benefit analysis that impacts majority of the rural population that does not accommodate the current infrastructure setting uh, uh, in, uh, in Africa. So let us rethink uh, our strategy, but also uh, to invest more on cost benefit analysis so that the majority of the populations will be able to benefit from the ongoing developments. A case study, Tanzania's uh, gas pipeline, since it was constructed in 2015, until now we are talking of 20, less than 20% gas consumption that has been channeled across the country. Again, now we are moving to other mega projects like hydro. So we are lacking prioritization in the sense of how do we recoup our decision in that matter? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Richard, I don't want to leave you last this time. So, Okay, my last thought, uh, and again, many from the South African context, is the overwhelming narrative we have from uh, both government and the Department of Energy is that gas is essential for just transition. How are we going to do it? Uh, our stance is that the evidence indicates uh, both with alternatives improving, with uh, risks of gas increasing, and just where our, our power sector in particular is, the question should be, do we still need it? And who is going to benefit? Like, you know, are we making decisions in the national interest or is it to keep um, various sort of companies in their existing line of work? And we need to be honest about that and have debate. So there we go. Thanks, short and sweet. Uh, Celso, your closing remarks, please. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, um, I mean, just final points uh, uh, to mention that, in my point of view, uh, um, the energy security is important for uh, development of, of, uh, of the country. With energy security, I mean having stable access to energy sources on a timely, sustainable, and affordable basis. I know that in Mozambique right now, the hydropower is um, is the dominating electricity source, which is at around seventy five percent. Uh, and the gas and coal together, gas is 16% and solar only 1%. Okay. But it has implications because so far, only around 35 to 40 households have access to electricity, and half of those 
are located in Maputo and surrounding areas, meaning that in the rest of the country and the rural areas are really struggling to have access to energy. When I think of gas as, as um, let's say, um, as a I mean, the use of gas for, for development, at least in Mozambique, there are a number of projects to use uh, gas locally. There are some, I mean, uh, institutional uh, um, um, the, the stuff that is making it not happening, but there are these projects of using gas uh, to generate power locally in order to uh, electrify the rest of the country. I'm not sure because the idea right now is to have uh, reliable and cheap energy. I'm not saying that um, um, the, the, the green um, energy is not reliable or is not cheap. I don't know. I don't have the cost benefit analysis. I'm just saying that since we have the gas right now, maybe you could use it, use it for something while we prepare for the transition, maybe. Thank you. Thanks also. Samba, any last thoughts? Um, yes, I I'm really in line with what we have been said, but uh, from the Senegalese perspective, I see actors, uh, we think that uh, option at one level, but what we have to make sure and to help uh, uh, government to, to, to do is just as a non-state actors to provide evidence base based on cost benefit analysis, but also modeling the pathway where we see what would be what have to be done in order to make sure the local community will have access to energy services, whether it is gas or not. But what we ne really need to think about is out of energy to, to think about the supply chain, but also from the demand side, how to really get our uh, option, cleaner option, which must match, match with the energy need. And on, on of it to first dialogue with our decision decision makers because uh, if not it will be difficult to reach out the, the local community needs in terms of agriculture and also in terms of uh, lives for the energy services so, uh, these are in a nutshell what i some insightful that i would like to share for my ending again for the opportunity given to to us Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to apologize. I know we had a question online, uh, but we've short, sadly run out of time. Um, on behalf of the Africa Climate Foundation, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and again, just to like a reminder that this is just the beginning of the, many of these conversations that we will have. Um, and we look forward to hosting you guys again. So thanks a lot. And